Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Two Guys in the Bible. Mike and Dale here, ready to present another, what we believe is a good lesson for us today, straight out of God's Word, uh, straight out of God's Word. Today, we're in Luke chapter 4, uh, talking about Jesus beginning his ministry and traveling back to Nazareth and what that experience was like. But before we get started, as always, um, we do want to give you an opportunity to post any praises. First of all, we want to hear the good stuff. And let us know of any prayer requests. Uh, we definitely want to know about those. Like we always say, if we don't know about it, we can't pray about it. Uh, also, we want to do something a little different today. We want to take roll here in Sunday school. So if you're watching with us, just type in uh, here, and your name will show up, and we'll know that you're with us. And remember, at any point during the lesson, uh, if you've got a comment or a question or want us to try to clarify something, just type that in and we'll do our best while we're online watching it with you to try to answer that question and keep us going in the right direction. But uh, I'll pray for us real quick and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. Um, thank you for this opportunity that you've given Dale and I again, Lord, uh, to present your word to our church and all the many viewers uh, that are out there, Lord. We pray that we have been faithful to your word, Lord, um, that we deliver it in a way um, that is understandable and able to be applied in people's lives, Lord. Uh, thank you for the many blessings going on in our lives, Lord, around us, Lord. We see them all around us, Lord, and we don't take enough time each day to thank you for them, Lord. Um, as we learn in this lesson today, Lord, help us more and more each day to trust in your promises in your word, Lord, and let that strengthen and guide us, uh, excuse me, guide us uh, through our daily walk. Again, we thank you for all things. We give you honor and praise in this lesson. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, they'll get us started. Well, again, we're in the Gospel Project, uh, about to draw uh, to a close in the, uh, in the spring book. Uh, two or three more lessons yeah, in spring. Yeah, about that. Um, but we're, we're looking at Jesus reveals his mission this week. Um, of course, we're still, we're still at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, last week we were in Capernaum, uh, and, and Jesus, uh, we, we were looking at his power, his, his purpose, and his compassion right. uh, in his ministry. Uh, this week we're going to focus a little more on Jesus' mission and how he chose to reveal it to the people. Uh, as usual, in kind of a shocking way, <laughs> uh, Jesus had a, had a knack for uh, shock, kind of shocking the crowds uh, sometimes. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to look at how Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy of the Messiah that was to come. Um, of course, uh, and, and we'll look a little more uh, about uh, Isaiah's book, about his prophecy. Uh, and then finally... Uh, we're going to look at how Jesus handled rejection. Uh, of course, that's a good thing to know in the Christian life because not yes. everybody wants to hear what we have to say. That's right. Uh, not everybody's going to accept what we have to say. Sometimes those closest to us. And, and we need to learn a way not to take that to heart. Uh, that's, that's not a, a personal rejection of us. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But... Um, you know, a lot of stories, and, and I read a lot. Do you? I know you read a lot, too. I do. We're both Audible customers, aren't we? Yes. Um, but a lot of stories have a hero that was prophesied about, and yeah. he comes and he saves the day, uh, stuff like that. Uh, C.S. Lewis has one of those books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Right. Uh, I think most people probably uh, either read that or watched the movie when they were kids about four kids who were prophesied about that would come and defeat the evil uh, in the kingdom of Narnia. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what are some real life prophecies you can think of, Michael? Like are there the any prophecies of Nostradamus? Those real life promises? <laughs> uh, prophecies? Yeah, because all of those come true, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, some prophecies that are really going to come true. That are really going to come true and that are actually kind of uh, right in our plate uh, right now as we go through uh, Pastor Keith Joseph's book Urgency as we walk through Revelation each week in our devotion and in our Sunday sermons we're learning a lot about prophecies prophecies of, of Satan the end times the tribulation Christ winning the new kingdom wow. all these are prophecies things that are going to happen so wow. yeah we're 
there's prophecies right there. All kinds of prophecy yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and some have already come true. Uh, like you said, some are still to come true mm -hmm. uh, at the end times. Um, so, well, let's jump on into the, um, the lesson today and, and let's look at how Jesus declared that he is the Messiah of Isaiah's prophecy. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you want to read for us, um, Michael, and we are in Luke 4 today. Um, so this passage is Luke 4, 16 through 22, uh, if you want to read for us. Glad to. And he came to Nazareth, where he, had, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all of them spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Okay, well, last week we talked a little bit about how Jesus draws the attention of a crowd. Uh, yeah. He was also in a synagogue yeah. uh, in Capernaum. And uh, that's when the demon-possessed man kind of interrupted his lesson. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, to, to a small yeah, a extent. Bit until he uh, told him to get out of here. But, um, but he did that again uh, today in a different way. Um, a as was common, and, and we've talked about how rabbis taught in those days, um, they would come into the synagogue, uh, ask for a scroll to read, uh, read the scroll, and then sit down and teach on it. And so that's what Jesus did today. Um, but most of the Jews in this time period would have recognized what Jesus read. Oh, absolutely. Now, why is it they would have, this, this specific uh, scripture, why is it they would have recognized that, Michael? Yeah, so this particular passage spoke uh, of the coming Messiah, the promised one, the one who, if you think about it, at this time in Jewish history, they were under severe oppression from the mm -hmm. Romans, they were looking for the Messiah to come and set them free. Uh, they really wanted this to happen. And, you know, Dale, I think sometimes the power and the importance of what the prophets said uh, is lost on us sometimes in this time. If you go back to this time in Jewish history, they absolutely knew who Isaiah was right. without question. But they also believed firmly like change their life belief in two things that they learned and in, in, we learned in Deuteronomy chapter 18. One, the prophet absolutely spoke the words from God. Okay? okay. God gave him those words to speak. He didn't make it up on his own. Right. It wasn't some crazy idea he had. It's just an interesting story, an anecdote. No. These are words from God spoken by the prophet and they are 100% accurate. Hmm. Not Maybe not if all, as we say, all the moons and the stars <laughs> line up, this will happen. It is guaranteed to be true. It is guaranteed to happen. So when Jesus read this, he had their attention, dramatically had their attention. Right. And, and like we said, you know, they would have known most of the book, if not all of the book of Isaiah. Yeah. Because it's the most authoritative um, book on, on the prophecies mm -hmm. uh, foretelling the coming of a Messiah. Uh, Isaiah actually foretold everything from uh, how the birth was going to happen, several things about Jesus' life, about his death. Uh, about, Isaiah I mean, 53. He, yeah, I, I mean, he nailed several aspects of Jesus' life. So as, as, a, as a faithful Jewish person, uh, who is looking for the Messiah to come, mm -hmm. they would have known, uh, they would have memorized a lot of the scripture to know what to look for when, a, when, a Messiah, when the Messiah did come. Yeah. Um, and, and I wrote down a note here. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I kind of pointed out 
uh, in my notes here. That are, are we guilty sometimes of focusing too much on Scripture that we like or Scripture that says something we like? Oh. Um, I, I mean, we're talking about the Jewish people memorizing Isaiah because yeah. they're tired of the oppression of the Roman Empire. Uh, so that meant something to them personally. Mm -hmm. How much of the rest of the Old Testament had they memorized? Yeah. You know, uh, are we guilty now of just grabbing a verse here, I can do all things to Christ, uh, or something that would benefit us personally instead of being faithful to read all of Scripture? I think if you read and take Scripture properly, it is absolutely going to challenge you. And if you're not challenged by Scripture, you're not reading all of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't just stick with something that's easy. Go ahead and read what's mm -hmm. around that. Easy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but in verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, the place where he had been brought up. Um, you know, that's just a very important phrase in this lesson today. This This entire scene that we're looking at today was something that was dear to Jesus' heart. This He has gone back home. His home church. Yeah, his home church, his yeah. home synagogue. Um, this is where his family and friends are. And, and so um, something dear to his heart. And, and when, when, we, when we are around our friends, when we're around our family, we're vulnerable, aren't we? I mean, mm -hmm. if they approve of us, if they don't approve of us, uh, we kind of leave ourselves open uh, to, to criticism or, or praise and, and vulnerable mm -hmm. to how they react to us. So th this is a, uh, an important time uh, in Jesus' life here. But, you know, um, the people, I'm sure, are saying, uh, isn't it odd that, you know, isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter, uh, and now he's saying he's the one that's going to deliver our people yeah. uh, from the Roman Empire? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus makes a, a comment in the, uh, in the lesson that, that prophets are never accepted by their own people because those people have seen them grow up. They've seen them as a regular person, a regular kid, uh, and, and they don't accept them when they've become, uh, when they've grown That's up right. and be, being used by God. Well, and they had a different image in their mind of what the Messiah was going to look like. It wasn't going to be the son of a carpenter, a humble, well-spoken, obviously, very sharp. I'm sure they knew he was a sharp individual mm -hmm. as he grew up. But they, you know, they had the image on horseback, sword drawn. I mean, later on in his ministry, they tried to set him up as king, and he, no, <laughs> well, this is not what I've come know, to do. It was, what, about 100 years before this that Spartacus... Mm -hmm. uh, rose up a lot of uh, a slave rebellion yep. against Rome. Yep. Uh, and I, that's the kind of deliverer they were probably looking for. That's right. Someone a little more important than a, than a uh, rebellious yeah. slave. But that, that's still the kind of deliverer um, they were looking for. Um, but however, Isaiah's prophecy wasn't just talking about someone that was going to deliver them from the Romans. It was someone that was coming from God. Uh, and, and so that's something that, that's, that's very different about Isaiah's prophecy is the Messiah was coming uh, from God. That's right. But, um, but, you know, the fact that Jesus would even claim to, to fulfill even one of Isaiah's prophecies uh, would have been bold, to say the least, uh, uh, prophecies about the coming Christ. But Jesus did. He, he took that bold move because he is who he says he is. That's right. And he needed people to know, I, I mean, he needed to take bold steps and say, I am this Messiah. I have come. Uh, this is your chance to follow me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, th there's all kinds of little lessons uh, through this bigger lesson oh, yeah. that we can take from this today. You know, uh, I, when we hear people say, you know, my lifestyle is going gonna, is gonna to save my neighbor, you know, without me ever making a verbal witness for God, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need to add a little boldness to that and, right. and have that verbal witness. Uh, take, take a little lesson from Jesus in his boldness. Uh, the, the people needed to know he was a Savior. Well, your neighbor needs to know that Jesus was a Savior. That's right. And, and they may not gather that just from us living uh, a godly lifestyle. But... Um, 
But you know, like you like you said before, um, we, we, a lot of times we think of prophecy. Uh, we hear a prophecy, and then we wait and we wait to see if someone just happens to come along to fill all of those aspects of that prophecy. Sometimes by accident. Uh, well, that's that's not exactly how God works. Is no. it? He, he doesn't work by accident. We we said a lot of times through our lessons that that um, we need to have intentional Christianity. We we worship an intentional God that's right. that always has a plan in place. Um, Isaiah's prophecies were, like you said, inspired word, straight from God. And, and what is one of the things that we worship about God? What's one of his attributes that we worship about him? Omniscience. One of the big O's. One yes. of the big O's. Omniscience. Omniscience. And and what are some of the the qualities of omniscience? Um, uh, of course, it means all knowing. But knowledge is complete. There's his knowledge is complete. Missing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Th that says a lot right there. His knowledge is complete in the past, in the present, in the future. His and knowledge is complete. And it's not a knowledge of what might happen. Right. It's a knowledge of what will happen. Well, you know, we were talking about uh, Tuesday night. I, I love small groups. Yeah. Uh, Keith asked the question, how would you describe God to somebody? A and... One of the things that I guess impresses me about God is He is outside of time. Mm. Uh, so, so He is not linear, uh, waiting for something to happen. If He's outside of time, He knows everything that has happened, past, present, and future. He's right. already seen it. And so because He's already seen the future, He could dictate to Isaiah's and, and Isaiah's prophecies we're, we're just nail on. Uh, he perfectly mm -hmm. described Jesus' birth down to the last letter. Um, described Jesus' life. Described his death oh, yeah. very, very accurately. Vividly. Because, uh, you know, like you said, it's not a guess. It's God who has already seen the future yeah. dictating to Isaiah to write down prophecy. It's not really prophecy because in God's eyes, it, he's already seen it happen. <laughs> So, so we need, you know, when we when we look at, hear that word, we kind of think of, uh, you know, sit down, I'll read your palm, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll hit one out yeah. of five things that are going to happen this week. It's not one of those. That, that's things. not how God works. No. Not how God works. Um, anyway, anyway, um, Jesus reads this passage out of Isaiah. Um, the Isaiah's passage is more than just prophecy about a Messiah coming. It's really a message of hope. Uh, it's a message of salvation. Um, in, in Isaiah's time, uh, his words gave hope to the, to the Jewish people who were in exile in Babylon. Okay. So, so they, were, they were hearing his words and, and looking forward to getting out of exile. Um, but, um, but really... You know, Jesus' ministry was much, much bigger than just Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, Isaiah was talking to a specific people, the Jewish people, but but when Jesus uses this uh, these these scriptures out of Isaiah, uh, he's talking about hope on a much bigger scale. Yeah, uh, you know, we I don't know if it was last week or I'm sure over the last few weeks I know we've hit on this that as we're going about our day and our Christian walk. There's a lot more going on than just the feeling of the moment that we're in. There's a bigger picture agenda right. that Jesus had and that we should have in our walk. Um, you know, the Jews at this time, just like in Isaiah's time, they were looking for release from oppression uh, from an oppressor. You know, Jews in this time, Romans were the oppressors, but Jesus came not to deal with that momentary thing they were facing because oppressors right. come and go. And he wasn't, look at the cycle. And he they wasn't talking and about a specific nation. No, no. Jesus is going to deliver the entire world. He was coming with a bigger agenda to deal with a much bigger, longer-lasting issue, the issue right. of sin. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus quoted Isaiah. He quoted Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. 
but not all of verse 2. He stopped short. Um, let's look at just a little bit of snippet uh, of Scripture that he left off. Yeah. Uh, it says, In the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, or the day of judgment is coming. Um, so when Jesus left off this little, last little snippet of that scripture, uh, is he trying to change the meaning of the scripture? Not at all. I, I believe when, when he stopped where he did and he said, this today, this scripture, the one I have just read, has been fulfilled. The second part is still yet to come. Okay, but but he's also putting emphasis on the first part mm -hmm. that his mission is about salvation. Yeah. Um, he he's not coming emphasizing judgment. He's emphasizing salvation. Right. Now now Jesus did have a lot to say about judgment, but you know. The reason he had to he had to say a lot about judgment is not because that's what he was all about, but you have to know there's a judgment coming to know that you need salvation. Uh, if you don't know there's going to be a deadline, you don't ever you don't ever know that you need to start right. working on something, right? right? So even though Jesus talked about judgment a lot, he wanted people to know that his mission was salvation. We want as many to come back to the Father mm -hmm. as will come. Uh, John 3.16, he came to save the world. It's a mission of mercy. It's a mission of love. Uh, it's a mission of salvation. That, Amen. That, that is what Jesus is all about. And he had to say, though, at some point you have to get started because there is a deadline. Mm -hmm. There is a deadline that's coming, which is what we've been reading about in Revelation. That's right. Um, well, let's move on. Um, Jesus predicted that he would be rejected just like the prophets. Uh, and... and you know, what What really a tragedy. I mean, we've read, we've had lessons and lessons, and we've read through the Old Testament, and Israel just, they would get it for a short period of time, and then they wouldn't. That's right. Uh, and just keep falling, and and they there always needed to be a prophet trying to call Israel back to, to God. There always needed to be um, someone there trying to get Israel back on the right track because they just seemed to not get it and not get it. So so the prophets when they were when Israel was doing their own thing and the prophets were telling them God's word that doesn't fit together real well. That, so so the prophets were rejected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we said before when you walk into a room and turn on the light the bugs run for the run for the shadows. Well that that's how that's how the nation of Israel was and that's how they treated their prophets. And Jesus is doing the same thing. He's bringing uh, he's not only bringing the word of God, he is God. Uh, and so all of the darkness is trying to hide. It's trying to fight back. Um, you know, he, he said that, that's why he said, you know, if you follow him, you're going to upset the darkness in the world. And, and life is not going to be real easy for you. Right. Uh, and, and if you're not upsetting the darkness in the world, maybe we are not looking as much like Jesus as we think we are. Think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just... If your uh, Christian life is easy, are you really doing it right? Right, right. But go ahead and read uh, read our scripture for us in, in section 2 there. Yeah. Jesus predicted he would be rejected like the prophets. It's Luke, 42, excuse me, Luke chapter 4, 23 through 27. And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Okay. Um, you know, mob mentality is kind of a funny thing, isn't it? Uh, you, you can sway, them, sway people this way, and you can sway people that way. One, the, that first passage of Scripture we read said uh, people heard Jesus read the read out of the scroll, mm -hmm. and they were saying, 
what a nice guy. Yeah, he, he had a pleasant voice. Uh, we, we enjoyed listening to him. Now people are starting to get upset. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus points out the fact that they have had opportunities before to, to turn to God, to follow God, and they miss the boat. This is another opportunity, and they're missing the boat again. So now he's, he's starting to say things that are stepping on their toes. Um, you know, the, like we'd already talked about, the Jews had been looking for a Messiah. Uh, they were looking expectantly for a Messiah because they were tired. They've always been under, uh, ever since the Babylonians conquered them, they've been under somebody's rule, mm -hmm. uh, not, not self-ruled. So they're expectantly looking for a Messiah. But when he came, he, just like we talked about, he didn't come like they expected him to come. He didn't come as an earthly king uh, to put Rome in their place. Uh, when he came with a spiritual kingdom, it's really not what they were looking for. So, so that starts uh, just building up all of this rejection that, that Jesus is going to experience. Um, and then, um, you know, the, le the lesson points out the fact when Jesus kind of preempts them by saying, uh, I guess you're going to quote to me uh, out of the Bible, physician, heal yourself. What did he say? It was a proverb, right? Uh, you're going to quote to me a proverb, physician, heal yourself. It means that they didn't believe all the stories that were coming out of Caper Capernaum about all the things he had done there, uh, about casting out the demons, healing the sick. Uh, all those stories made their way to Nazareth, and they're like, mm -hmm. if this is true, yeah. you do these things for us. You know, in our day and age, sometimes we can be in a conversation with someone, and if you're in that agitated mood, we all get there sometimes, and we can say, I already know what you're going to say. <laughs> okay? And, and what how often that, are we right? <laughs> how often are we right, and how often does that make the other people just, it just blesses their heart. Just it, blesses their it heart. It doesn't. But the thing with Jesus, it, this isn't one of those situations where Jesus says, well, I already know what you're going to say, and they just are... I can't believe you would think that. I would never think that. No, Jesus knows what's on people's minds. I mean, think about all the times in Scripture. He says, why do you have this in your heart? Why are you right. thinking this? He knows what they're thinking in this moment. He really does. That's really right. Jesus knew people's hearts. He, yes. he, when, when he made a statement like that, he wasn't guessing. Let me guess what you're going to say next. He knew people's hearts. And then he topped it off. <laughs> now, at this point in Jewish history, they were looking back to the prophets. Right. Okay? All right. So they're looking back. They have the Old Testament scrolls. And even at this time, they're looking back and saying, you know what? Those people in Jewish history, they did not treat the prophets well. We would never do that. <laughs> and what does Jesus do? He says, you're just like you're them. You're just like them. Wow. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you know, I, I keep going back to small groups, but I get a lot out of our small groups. And uh, Tuesday we were, we were talking about, you know, just like the Israelites were looking so expectantly for their Messiah to come, and then they missed him when he came. We, we a lot of times tell ourselves we are, living, we are living expectant lives for God, you know, waiting on him to act, waiting on him to come again. And, and, and then when he does talk to us, our lives are so busy we don't hear him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that really the same kind of picture. Uh, like yeah. You know, I, what built up to that, you know, Keith was saying, uh, well, what's your favorite TV show? You know, Harmless, right? Harmless, harmless question. Sure. And then you answer and he's like, Baked. <laughs> uh, so you're binge watching TV instead of, <laughs> instead of doing what you're supposed to do. But, uh, but yeah, so we think we're living expectant God, uh, expectant lives waiting for God to work, and then when he does call us to do something, we miss it because mm -hmm. our lives are too full of junk. Yeah. Um, in, in this set of scripture, Jesus talks about Elijah and Elisha, uh, two of the prophets in, in the northern kingdom of Israel after, after the big kingdom of Israel had split into two kingdoms. Uh, there was a north kingdom um, of Judah and a, a is that right? The North Kingdom, North Kingdom of Israel, Southern Kingdom of Judah, or did I get that mixed up? Anyway, no, you have that right. Okay, all yeah. right. Anyway, these two prophets, Elijah and Elisha, were prophets in the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Uh, and uh, what's interesting about the 
the two stories that Jesus brings up is that um, when these prophets were trying to tell the people of Israel God's word and they were rejected, they took their blessings to people outside of Israel. Yes, they did. Um, and, and, and telling, you know, that would have been something, a very sensitive sore spot to the Jewish people yeah. that Jesus is talking to. Because, I mean, it meant everything to be a Jew. And, and, and if you were a Gentile, you were dirt. I, I, if you ever doubt that, just look at the stories of the, the Samaritan, yeah. the, the, the good Samaritan, how they didn't want to have anything to do with someone of mixed race. That's right. And you know, last week we kind of hit for just a few minutes talking about the authors of the books of the Bibles, particularly the Gospels. They kind of had a running theme. They had an emphasis in their books. And, yeah. you know, <clears throat> interesting, Luke would point this out, this part of Jesus' ministry in this conversation. Really, a running theme through Luke is Jesus' compassion for Gentiles. Samaritans, women, children, tax collectors, sinners, basically anyone that was considered outcast in and by Israel. Right. Okay, he really had compassion, and, and Luke wanted to bring that out in his gospel. And I, thank you. Right. Thank you for showing us this. Right. So, so Elijah was sent to a widow, but not of Israel. It was a, it was a widow in Sidon, mm -hmm. which was a Gentile. And then Elisha... Uh, on one, one of the stories about Elisha, he was sent, uh, you know, there was many lepers in every nation. Right. Israel had plenty of its own lepers, but Elisha was not sent to an, a leper in Israel. He was sent uh, to Naaman, uh, who was a Syrian leper, also a Gentile. So both of these stories that Jesus quotes out of Scripture uh, are, are because <clears throat> the Jewish people, <clears throat> let me clear my throat You're there. Good. Because the Jewish people rejected their prophets, and so the prophets had to take God's blessings outside of Israel. He's using an illustration that they immediately realized what he was doing. Immediately, uh, immediately. All right, and now and now he's saying, if if you you know when you rejected the prophets, you rejected God. Now, if you reject me, you are rejecting God. Um, He's drawing a line in the sand. He, he is drawing a line. Well, for non-Christians, it, it was very clear. If you, reject, if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting God. Uh, the only, and, and there's scripture, you know, now, the only way to the Father is through the Son. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is very cogent for today uh, when everyone's saying all roads lead to Rome. You know, uh, everything you want to do, as long as you're sincere about it, you're going to end up in heaven. Mm. You know, and, and, and that's why we're here with the truth, you know, to, uh, to shine a light on all that rotten mess. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, Jesus', Jesus message was clear to Christians, too. When God acts and you feel a calling to join God's work, if you say no, you haven't stopped God's work. No. His, his work moves on. And you just missed the boat. Uh, you know, he's going to call somebody else to get the blessings of joining him in his work. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, the calling is really for non-Christians uh, to accept Jesus. Uh, that's the way to God. It's a calling for Christians. Uh, when God is working, we join him mm -hmm. uh, in his work to get the blessings right. and, and go with Jesus. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's an illustration in the book about a bunch of scientists in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, this book, not the Bible. <laughs> no, not the Bible, in this book. Uh, and and they, they wanted to come up with some kind of new, uh, new compound or new solvent that would cut grease and, and wipe up dirt and kill bacteria. And they tried and they tried. They made the tenth time they weren't happy with it, the hundredth time they weren't happy with it, the 300th time they weren't happy with it and they finally came the 409th time they came up with a compound they they liked what they got and that's how we have formula 409 i like it the daily household cleaner wd-40 has a similar uh similar does it story yeah they they wanted to come up with a water displacement formula so formulas 1 through 39 didn't make the cut but number 40 was the one that worked. So now we have WD-40. 
Well, you know, th those are kind of funny uh, stories, and, and they're, they're stories that, uh, that help us, you know, kind of get an idea of never stop. Right. Uh, every time you, uh, every time, you're never going to succeed if you stop on one of the times you fell. Uh, but, you know, Jesus kind of had that attitude, um, a terrible reception here in his hometown. He, you know, and, of course, um, you know, Jesus cuts to the truth. He, he doesn't really sugarcoat anything. Uh, he, he told them of times they've missed the boat in the past. Uh, they're in danger of missing the boat right now. And, and instead of repenting and following him, they got mad and, and they uh, were about ready to run him out of town. Uh, but Jesus took this rejection and, and he's going to move on. He's going to keep going. He knows that his, uh, you know, the priorities of God's kingdom come first before uh, his own rejection. And like we said, this is a very sensitive place for Jesus. This, and they're rejecting him. So that's got to be extremely hard on him. But he's still putting the priorities of God's kingdom first. And he's going to keep going. And, and that has to be the driving force in our lives. Because we're going to face trials in this Christian world. We're going to face rejection. Right. Um, we use that story, the illustration of 409 and WD-40. There were so many failures leading up to that win. But, you know, Dale and I, you and I were talking about this earlier. In the, here's the problem we, we face as in modern day people, Christians, whoever. We expect immediate gratification. Okay. Yeah. If I do something, I immediately want, want what I want to happen to be right then. Right. Okay. I don't have time to cook a meal in the oven, pop it in the microwave. I don't have time to go to the store and buy something. I'm just going to order it on Amazon and I've got to pay for Prime because I want to hear in two days, not three. <laughs> okay. That's right. We want things to happen right now. But the thing is, many things in our Christian walk, if we have the wrong mindset, will say, I just failed at that. I shared with somebody yesterday and they didn't accept Christ right then. I failed. Here's how we need to be looking at this, okay? Are we keeping the bigger agenda in mind? If the answer is yes, great. Did we answer that calling to be obedient to what God wanted us to do in that moment? Well, yeah. Well, just because it didn't work out the way you planned it would doesn't mean you failed at anything. Okay, if you're obedient and you follow the calling, that's not a failure. You, you were successful. <laughs> you did what you were supposed to right. do. You know, sometimes we get hung up on it didn't work out in that moment. Well, maybe it's God's plan that you just planted a seed in that moment, and the next person is going to help it grow into something. Right. You just you just do what you're called to do. That's yeah. not failing. You know. Um... To kind of put things in perspective, we asked the question the other day, what would you do if there were three days, if you knew there were three days left in the world before the world was going to be destroyed? Uh, and Michael Medlin said, I would go tell as many people as I could, hey, you got three days. Yeah. you got to make a decision. And, and it, you know, then we asked him, well, would you wait around for their answer? Or would you just keep going and telling as many people as you could? Uh, you That's know, a good follow-up. You know, if, if we look at everything today with that kind of urgency, like there is a deadline, and we don't know when it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Could be when we get home tonight. You know, um, yeah. you're going to tell as many people as possible, and you may not even wait around and worry about the answer. Let God work in their heart That's after right. you planted that, right. that seed. Um, and you tell as many people as possible. That's your job. And God's job is to is to work, work with it in their heart. Yeah, Amen. Well, let's move on. Read, read for us Luke four twenty eight through thirty one. Yeah, part three of our section here. Uh, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. Okay. Well, you know, confronting people is not ever easy. I, I don't think we ever go out looking forward to confrontation. Uh, it's not a fun thing, no. but sometimes it's necessary, right? Yes. 
Uh, and Jesus knew that sometimes it's necessary to bring things to a, a, a crossroad where people have to make a decision. And, and you know, these people of his hometown uh, just chose to re completely reject him, mm -hmm. completely reject him. Uh, and, and you know, and and again, this this is a lot of things that happen foreshadow what what's coming in the future. And and, and his hometown rejecting him like this kind of foreshadows Holy Week when he goes back to Jerusalem and all all of the Jewish people reject him. Right. And he and he ends up getting killed. But th but this time, I mean, they've made up their mind. That he is he has said so many blasphemy things are blasphemous things already, they're gonna kill him. Yeah. And they take him outside of the, the, the town and they're gonna throw him off a cliff. And but you know, we talked a couple of lessons ago about Jesus is here for a purpose mm -hmm. and until it's the appointed time for him to complete that purpose, God is not gonna let him come to harm. Right. And and so he just walked right out of the middle of this crowd. They were to there. They were there to throw him off the cliff, and because it was not his appointed time, he just walked right out, right away. That's a miracle. I mean, that's a miracle happened right here. It doesn't say he was surrounded by a team of security guards. <laughs> right. You know, it just he, he he just walked away. Yeah. The implication is that. This is a miraculous thing that happened. Right. You know, if I've got a mob of people ready to do me harm, I don't think I'm just going to get out of it on my own. But, you know, I, I, I started thinking about just the fact that what it means that this was Jesus' home. Um, think about if you went back for a high school reunion. And, and because of something you said at the high school reunion, maybe you said you're a Christian and that didn't work for everybody, they ran you out of that high school reunion with rotten fruit. I, you know, and I mean, some of Jesus' family was here. Yeah. He's being rejected by some of his family. We've already talked about. They thought he was crazy. Well, we've already talked about his brother James that wrote the book James. Yeah. Until James met him after the resurrection, yeah. he thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. So, see, this has got to be an extremely tough time for Jesus. You know, Dale, I, I see this passage and. When we, when we think about what we talked about last week, about midway through our passage last week in Mark, uh, Jesus, he was basically lifted up by the entire crowd. Not literally, but his name was golden. Everybody was talking about how awesome he was, encouraging him, bringing him all the neighbor's kids for him to do something with them. I mean, they loved him, okay? But when he went off to a desolate place to pray, they tried to go get him. He said, hey, they're all, basically, they're all here to see you again. He says, we're to go on to the next town, yeah. okay? In this passage, in that passage, they loved him. And if we were in that situation, we'd want to stay around the people that were constantly patting us on the back, okay? But he saw the bigger agenda and went on to the next town that needed to hear the message. In this passage, they hated him, okay? Mm -hmm. He didn't let that let make him stumble either. What does it say in verse 31? After all this, they wanted to kill him, and he passed through their midst. What does he do? Does he go and mope around about it? Does he take a sabbatical for three months because they hurt his feelings? No. He went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. He didn't let it stop him. He, he had his priorities straight. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a lot of times... When we ask people at church and Sunday school, how do you prioritize your life? People give some church answers, but you know we prioritize God, family, church, and job. Is that is that how you would put it? I think that's how we need to put it. Yeah. Uh, why is it important to get those set in our minds and in our hearts before we go out into the world? We might run into opposition in one of those areas. You know. Family is great and friends are great, but there's no one worse than those two groups of people if you are trying to change your life because those groups of people are going to keep reminding you of who you were 10 years ago, who you were 15 years ago. I think your, your, your uh, testimony is something like that. <clears throat> you know, you had to tell your friends, I can't go there anymore. Yeah. Well, I know you did this, this, and this five years ago. Yeah. I'm not that guy anymore. So, you know, sometimes those people can be anchors for us in the past. 
and keeping us from following and and keeping us from going down that road of sanctification because they're holding us back. So before we run into that opposition, we need to know in our minds and in our hearts, this is the priority I have my life set in. I already know that I have God set above family members that are going to try to put me back here five years ago. I already know that I have God set above friends who are going to try to put me back here five years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that isn't going to be my priority. Uh, And it's important to have that set up already before we go out and meet that opposition. Yeah. um, We should all memorize that and just make it part. You know what? That could probably very easily be part of a daily prayer Mm -hmm. that we need to add into our prayer list when we're not interceding for others, when we're praying for ourselves. Most definitely. Because, not just because it's important, but hey, we're going to need some strength outside of ourselves to be able to carry that out. It's hard. It's very hard. Well, Michael, can all the stuff we've been talking about, is there a way, you, do you have anything to tie all this up? Tie it up with a bow, you say. <laughs> tie it up uh, real neat. We've been here and so there. So basically, it's kind of like my son doing the 52 card pilot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, pick right. that up. No, I'm kidding. No, we're. This has been a great lesson. I've had a. I've had a good time doing this one with you, Dale. I, I enjoy all of our lessons together. But I do too. You know, we want to end in some application, and and I just wrote down some thoughts here as I was going through this study and preparing what this spoke to me. I hope it speaks to you in a similar way. Um, one, you know, we need to draw strength, not a feeling of rejection. From the truth of Scripture. Amen. Dale, we started out saying that sometimes we can cherry pick the Scriptures we like and avoid the ones that challenge us. Yeah. Well, you know what? The ones that challenge us are often the ones that end up giving us the most strength anyway. Okay? Yeah. Drop strength from Scripture. Here's some points in Scripture we've even talked about today. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Settle that. It's right. done. With me, it's done so. That's settled. No one's going to convince me otherwise. There's strength in that. He died to liberate us from our earthly and eternal bondage to sin. We talked about earlier, you can't actually truly come to Christ and receive salvation unless you hear why you need to be saved. Right. Okay? You need to know you need to save. Yeah, you can't just hear the health and wealth gospel and leave the other part. You've You've got to know it all, okay? Uh, but he died to liberate us from that. Amen. There's strength and encouragement and power in that. But you know what? He also warned us to expect those hard times and rejection. I wrote down Matthew 10:16. Uh, he's sending out, sending us out as sheep amongst the wolves, and we're to be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. We need to remember these lessons we're learning in Scripture. That's the wisdom he's talking. We need to be wise in Scripture, wise in what to expect. He's telling us things can get tough. They will get tough in this path. Uh, I like the the phrase, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Very true. Okay? As Jeff Foxworthy would say, here's your sign, guys. Here's your sign. <laughs> right. Let's pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, he promised, you know what, though? He didn't just warn us that times are going to be tough. In his word... He promises us blessings as we face persecution for righteousness' sake. Righteousness' mm-hmm. sake. Just go to the Beatitudes, Matthew, the last couple of Matthew 5, 10 through 11. Expect it, but expect blessings through it, okay? Um, I, we, we had a member of our church post something on Facebook this week that really struck true to me. I know their family is facing something right now, um, but their, their post was, in this time in life, uh, we don't need to be focused on, why me? Be focused more on, what, would, what do you want to teach me in this, God? Mm. Okay? When we face these trials, uh, these rejections we, we face, in our, these troubles we face in our Christian life, never draw back and say, why, why am I having to go through this? Why is this hard? Mm. We know why it's hard, because you're standing up for Christ, if it's easy, we're not standing up for him. Right. Okay. Remember, it's not the. Don't look at the uh, lack of accomplishment, your idea of accompl- accomplishment in that moment as a failure. Look at it as 
God, I did exactly what you told me to do, and I'm trusting you with the rest. Mm. There's strength in that. That's right. So whether we face good times and we're getting a pat on the back for being a Christian, and we face those tough times and people are ready to run us out of town, draw strength in God's Word, draw strength in being obedient and carrying it out. Let God handle the rest. Beautiful. Amen. Yeah, that is exactly the truth. Amen. Well, let's pray, and, and we'll close out our lesson today because we're looking at the clock, and we're out of time. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you for the words you've given us today, Lord, and the reminder uh, of the type of Christians you would call us to be, Lord. Uh, you remind us that you give us strength. You've given us a model in, in Christ Jesus, Lord. We know things are going to happen. We can expect them. We know how to deal with them. Thank you, Lord for your word. Thank you for the work you're doing in each of us every day. Please, Lord, continue to give us the strength that we know you will to carry out your will each and every day. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank we'll you. see you next week.